Hello, go. good morning, and welcome to the feed. It's October 17th. I thought we were stuck there for a minute. We were stuck there with the title page for a minute. Time stopped for just a second, and then it started again. Alex is doing his technical thing again. He can stop time. And so anyway, here we are. We're with Bob and Jesse Haas. We're going to be doing some more Westminster history. It's going to be fun today, a really good fun day. It's, we're going to get to the mystery of the Westminster firebug, which we've been hinting at for a while, but we've never gotten to. But first we're going to talk with, uh, Marty's going to give us some local events, and then we're going to do a clip. Yeah, we have um, coming up Third Friday, 3FBF, if you ever see those signs around. A lot of people don't understand what that means. The third Friday of every month, there's a lot of activities in downtown Bells Falls. There's the October Farmer's Market, which will be happening at Hetty Green from 4 to 7. And there's a lot of events. Village Books Sellers usually has something going on. There's things going on oftentimes. Um, with the art, the local art scene in town. So just head downtown on Friday for 3FBF. And I want to remind everyone if you have, if you have any um, unused or expired medication that you can drop it off on Saturday, October 27th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Bells Falls Fire Department, the Wyndham County Sheriff Department, um, any of the local fire departments, so it's a great way to get rid of, get rid of your used, unused and expired medication. Turn it in safely. Don't just dump it in the trash. Yeah, that's not a good thing. Not a good thing. And that's one of the big uh, causes of people actually free medications sitting oh, around and oh, really? unused medications are how a lot it's... of people get started and then a lot of people continue their mm -hmm. habits. Yeah. And then just want to remind everyone that coming up also next Saturday is um, the fourth annual Chowder and Chili Cook-Off the Chamber of Commerce is running. We had Mary Helen Hawthorne here last week. Um, it's 12 to 3 p.m. It starts at the Flatiron. It's five dollars a person to do the tastings, and then you judge, and they pick a winner. Great, thank you. And what did we do last week? Was it last week or was it this week? We did that. We did a clip. We did a clip. We did some filming last week. We we're back on the back in the filming saddle. We did a PSA for Main Street Arts. And we're going to roll that clip right now because it's a um, Charles Henry's final curtain is coming up, and we have some history on that. Community, it's Marty from Greater Rock Fitness and Fact TV. I'm hanging out here at Main Street Arts with Cass Morgan, the creative genius behind Main Street Arts' newest production called Charles Henry's Final Curtain. And coincidentally, we happen to be in front of the Grand Drape, which was, was that his final curtain or just that was? We actually don't know which curtain he painted last, but most of the um, theaters and halls where he made curtains would have some version of this. So it would be what hangs like it is now, right at the edge of the proscenium to be pretty, to be used during meetings or weddings or whatever took place. So he would have painted one like this for lots of different places. So who was Charles Henry? Charles Henry was born in Guilford and he was an itinerant Scenic artist, actor, musician, writer, vaudevillian. <laughs> kind of like the local, the local Vermonter now. You gotta have five jobs, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and he had a lot of them. He kind of created himself. He was mm -hmm. self-taught. And um, he, somewhere along the line, he married a, a woman named Martha, who he met growing up in high school when he was doing theater as a kid. And he kind of just fell into it. He had a natural affinity and created um, a lifestyle and a world for himself here in Vermont. And he traveled all over and created these curtains for dozens of halls. They have them in Guilford, uh, in the Grange Hall there. They have them in Sudbury. They have them in Virgins. They have them everywhere. But Main Street Arts has a particularly large collection, don't they? We do. We actually have the most in the state and kind of by default the most in the country. Awesome. Because there, it's a very much of a New England thing, and specifically this part of New England. So, what about these curtains, and what about Charles Henry's tale inspired you to create this this play? I just, when I first learned about Charles, I um, I was talking with a couple of uh, Main Street Arts board members and about the Five Seasons project and the new curtains that the local artists were doing, uh, Eric Aho, Donald Saff, a whole bunch of Michelle Rattay, wonderful Vermont artists. 
And they kind of alluded to this guy and I, he just, it just jumped out at me as a Vermonter who was a vaudevillian, who wrote his own shows, who painted his own scenery, who who'd put on shows with his family and traveled around. I just thought, wait, that just, that's a play. That just screams that's a, That screams <laughs> out. I just, give me a pen. Give, I just have to write it down and boom, you know. And you have a little, a little background in, in play I, writing a little bit. A little bit. I would mm -hmm. say more as an actress and mm -hmm. a performer, but... Yeah, I was involved with the creating of uh, a show called Pump Boys and Dinettes that has had a very healthy life mm -hmm. all around the country okay. and the world, actually. And um, but that was different. That was the, we were a collective. There mm -hmm. were six of us who hung out together and, and who created the piece together and performed it together. Mm -hmm. But then um, I've always been a songwriter, and um, just when I was a kid, you know, taught myself on the guitar and. So I, in more recent history, I've focused more on actually sitting down to write a show. Mm -hmm. And did one at Weston a couple of years ago called The Road to Wear that I performed in. And this is the first time I've ever written anything that I'm not in. Oh, that's, I, I see, I thought you were in it. I didn't know. This is, no. This is, oh, awesome. The role that I would play is being played by the wonderful Libby McCauley. Mm -hmm. So, a no. well-known mainstream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, I, I I just thought, I just thought what a beautiful experience this would be to have a show, it's set right here in this space, in the Odd Fellows Lodge, which it, which it was and still is, um, for the uh, community theater group to have an original piece written for them to do, celebrating their history and culture. So that's, that's how it came about. That's awesome. So if you're interested and you want to know more about Charles Henry and his final curtain, then please come to Main Street Arts November 9th, 10th, 16th, and 17th. This play starts at 7.30. And also... Oh, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and November 18th, so, uh, excuse me, November 11th and 18th. Don't worry, we're going to show you a picture of this so it'll be clear. <laughs> um, if you need tickets, get to MainStreetArts.org and come and support Charles Henry's Final Curtain. Thanks so much, Cass. Thank you, Marty. We're travelers, we bring our show Through wind and rain, through heat and snow The weather's never stopped us, no We come to entertain you All right, we're back. <laughs> That was great. That was nice so job, fun. Marty. Thank you. That was so much fun. Cass was a wonderful person to interview, and it's a fascinating. And I didn't realize, actually, in, in sitting here talking, that Westminster has a curtain, too. Mm, we have a wonderful curtain. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to talk about that, too, sometime. Because you guys were involved in the restoration of that curtain, right? Well, I was. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, you, you. yeah my, no, I wasn't, but my, yeah, both mom and dad were. So, no. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of people in Westminster. Were you too small or too uh, young then? I ha was no, I wasn't small <laughs> or young. <laughs> I don't Sorry. know how I, <laughs> that, I, I evaded it somehow. I don't know how. I don't, it must have been fifteen years ago. I yeah. would guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so. but today we're here to talk about another portion of Westminster history. We're talking. We're going to talk about the Westminster Firebug. Who's going to lead off on this one? That's okay. going to lead off. Okay, I'm Bob Haas, Westminster. My daughter, Jessie, she wrote the history of Westminster. We're both trustees on the Westminster Historical Society. Jessie just signed up last week. and <laughs> For my sins. <laughs> we, we're going to talk about the Westminster firebug. And we first heard about it from, I guess, I, I think it was in a special edition of some local paper when they had the whole story and and then uh, there was a lady Bertha Miller Collins in Westminster that had a series of uh, she I don't know whether she was gonna write a history or but anyway she came out with a and a museum has these uh, little clips like uh, interesting items anecdotes things that happened in Westminster in the early days so uh, the museum has those and uh, yeah it's in this book um vignettes of oh, westminster uh, but she grew up she it's actually i i tend to forget it's her and her brother but bertha was a better self-promoter so we, both, <laughs> we think of it being her but they both grew up in westminster west yeah. so that so and and from 
a family that had been there forever. So yeah. And when was that published? Approximately oh. in the in the nineteen hundreds or ni yeah. Well, no, this came out in ninety four. Oh, okay. But she she put these together. Um, Probably in the 30s and 40s, uh -huh. but they then they were yeah, they yeah. were just Xerox sheets at the, that point when we first saw them. Interesting. And she was from and she, she remember the, these were stories were passed down from. Yeah, some family in town stories essentially. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Well, yeah, because and it, it's sort of a, it's um, you know when the Star historical society. You think of it it's a collection our museum is a collection of objects but it's also a collection of stories yeah, yeah. that are kind of hidden stories and and some of the you know some are just written down stories so you know there was just this whole sheaf of papers that nobody had read in a long time and um, and these old you know these things that had happened on the other thing I I th I think that there are several books of old newspaper clippings that we have that so somebody yeah, do there, there are, yep. so yeah. we have so when we wanted to learn more about it there you know there was a whole series there was some of places like you could if go some to. well th in those in those days <laughs> there were there was a Bellows Falls paper and a Brattleboro paper and there was local correspondence and they were you know they were local like there was a Westminster West correspondent. Oh, really? And a oh, Westminster yeah. correspondent, and maybe there was like an, somebody up on Orchard Hill that was also <laughs> sending. So, yeah. you know, for a, somebody writing history, there, it was a, it was really yeah, they were really out hunting for news to fill yeah. their column, and so all these little personal things that happen to people are in them. Really mm -hmm. local. Yeah. 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 Somebody's recovering from pneumonia, and you know, and just things like that. <laughs> right, and somebody's getting a new something or other in their kitchen. I don't like it. like they put in yeah, running new, water, you know. On <laughs> the floor in the kitchen. Right. Yeah. yeah. Kind of like so, a precursor to Facebook. Yeah, sort of. Yeah. Kind of, kind of yeah. yeah. Little, Very, little local yeah, stories. Really. Yeah. So the so what I first got interested in it was what, back when this was just sheets of paper, there's a story about somebody, you know, one of the people who was burned out in Westminster and so so to just to frame the story quickly mm -hmm. it was um, a series of fires that happened in 1883 and 84 in Westminster West uh, starting with but before that the, the schoolhouse one of the schoolhouses that you guys visited on yeah, cellar yeah. hole investigators one of those schoolhouses was uh, burned down they they didn't suspect arson at that time. It just, you know, it burned yeah. down. It was replaced. But then in 1883, people's, several, couple people's barns were burned. And one of them, did you guys go to the Campbell? Did, did you we go? Went there yeah, yesterday. We went there right, yesterday. Right, so where this famous sheep used to live, <laughs> old Grimes, yeah. uh, their barn was burned in the, you know, in the middle of the night. And the, the fires took place in the autumn, and you know when every the barns were full. You know the oh, full of hay, full of hay. Full yeah. of hay. Oh. The animals were in. They lost a lot of sheep. They lost ten, you know, in those days, ten thousand dollars worth. Wow, that's a lot. Of the Campbells days. lost. Yeah. Um, and then the house next door to my folks' place, yep. and th they had a. There that was, was Patrick Drizzling. Patrick Drizzling. He had a milk business, actually. I think he had a milk run that came to Bellows Falls. Yeah. And he, his barn was burned, and he lost cattle. And then it quieted down. And then the next autumn, more barns were burned. Um, one, the Patch Farm, again, where Cellar Hole yeah, investigators yeah, yeah. were had. That's where we first heard of Yeah. I'm, the, I'm, Looking in the uh, in the history, it was he he lost four large barns and sheds, all burned on October eighth, eighteen eighty four. So it was all around the same time of year. Too. Yeah. So yeah. October eighth, yeah, he lost five thousand dollars worth, wow. and then ten days later, north of town, one of the Harlows, George Harlow's house, George his barn was burned, and then three weeks later, his house and horse barn were burned down. Wow. And um, 
he so he lost everything and um, so people you know people were of course terrified like you know what's, yeah what are you gonna what do what is going yeah, on yeah. who could be doing this or, you know at that point it was clear <laughs> that somebody was <laughs> yeah, yeah. was doing it and um, they they actually there are several kind of tales of how they discovered it but one thing they did was bring in a detective from Boston well that yeah that's one of the things I wanted to ask about because it's like who did was there like the sheriff or was it like local police departments or I mean who was who was the constable well there the was a sheriff. yeah there was a, sh a constable there so I'm I'm just looking that this is um, taken from I think the the um, the newspaper article that you were talking about people sort of started to suspect this young man whose picture we have Johnny Coombs yeah um, described as a in the news a newspaper account as much below the average in intellect but shrewd and cunning in many <laughs> respects <laughs> Uh, and, and in Bertha oh, Collins, God. in the vignettes, she talks about he was somebody who was teased in school. And uh. he kind of, you know, he, he, if you look at his face, you know, with the you know, benefit so. of hindsight, he kind of looks like... He didn't fit in. He, that, yeah, he didn't fit in. He didn't fit in. But so people began to suspect him. And... Um, at when the, the Harlow fires, the house was burned during the daytime, and people suspected that it was that somebody used a slow match, which I don't really quite understand what a slow match is, but it sounds like a like a delayed charge yeah, of right. dynamite or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. And actually, the minister, Reverend Stevens, talked with him and kind of led the subject around, and and turned out that. Um, Johnny knew something about slow matches. Well, the books are full of them. He yeah, says. yeah. So apparently he was reading that kind of books, and um, the thing that the the really solid clue that they got was the fire that took place at the Gorham Farm at you know now Patch Farm. There was a track along the stone wall. Somebody walked along there in the mud, and there was a track with a patch on the sole. Oh. And they went to the shoemaker and asked, does this look familiar to you? And he said, yeah, I just did one of those for uh, Johnny Coombs. So they had a... They, CSI. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. It was like... <laughs> right. So they, they... Yeah, go ahead. They must have thought maybe that they re needed some expert help and called the people in from Boston. Yeah, so it, it was Ward and Wigan, a Boston firm of detectives. Uh, they had a a reward, they, the select board put up a thousand dollar reward to, to discover him. And then they, uh, you know, some of the, some of the legality of all of this, like, you know, today I think he would, he would have known not to speak without a lawyer, but basically they kind of got him off by himself and read him over a list of all the evidence yeah, they yeah. had. And he, he basically, he, and then they showed him the boot. The, the 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 track and that he'd been tracked from the the fire and 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 he's quoted saying I might as well plead guilty for you'll prove it against me though I am innocent and uh. he was arrested by De deputy sheriff level of actually Bellows Falls and taken up here to Bellows Falls and then um, taken back to Westminster West before for examination before Justice Lane in the chapel of the church which was just packed with listeners but he waived examination he refused a lawyer and he was taken to Newfane on a on three thousand dollars bail which I you know pretty pretty big amount of bail it is, yeah. and the, the paper account his bearing in the justice court was that of a proud self-consciousness as though he was the chief actor on an important occasion it is known that he had grudges against all the parties whose buildings had been burned. There are a few persons in the parish, in fact, against whom he has not had some grievance. Uh. And my understanding is, you know, our the farm that I grew up on, that Dad lives on, has a great big old barn, which is one of the oldest barns in town, as a mm -hmm. matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But that yeah. our 
the family that lived there, the Halls, was on, on his list. <laughs> but oh, but the, he, he, didn't we, have, he didn't get there yet. Get there yet didn't get there. Didn't get there. So we get to have that barn. He at that time he was the son of a Civil War veteran, and we were looking him up in um, what was the book you were looking it up in? Well, it's a roster of Civil War soldiers. Is Thousands and thousands of names. There's a book that thick. And oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. So Many his, thousand names. So his dad was... And he's in there from Westminster. So. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. so his... Tolman Coombs, he was a, he was a farmer. Apparently, uh, the, it was the 12th Regiment, and they, they were at Gettysburg, but they didn't fight. And, you know, uh-huh. It was a, a short tour of duty with a... They basically did mostly did picket duty, and mm-hmm. nobody, nobody died in <laughs> this whole regiment. But apparently, his father... His father contracted something. He, his, he's talked of as not recovering his health after yeah. the war. Well, a lot of the problems during the war were yeah. health With disease. Oh, it wasn't yeah. More people yeah. died of right. disease than yeah. died. So yeah. his father had died that the year he was he was arrested, 1884. Oh. His mother died a week to the day after he was arrested. His oh. mother is there's his mother. There's his too. mother, and then he was he was. Um, charged with the fire at the Gorham's and sentenced to three and a half years hard labor. So just on the one charge. And when he served his time, he was arrested on the courthouse steps and he was charged with the Campbell Barn Oh, fires. so they did like and cereal. And they put him back in. And actually, it was interesting. Uh, uh, that was actually the question of whether to per- prosecute him or not was on the on the town meeting warning. So really? They, yeah, so so the, it was actually voted the whole on. town yeah. voted on the it. Town, wow. Yeah, so they voted on it. They put him back in jail for another, he he, another, he was um, sentenced to 10 years. He was let out in eight years for good behavior, and they re-arrested him again, again before he cleared the prison walls, and they were going to charge him with another one. Wow. <laughs> Why would they have not just charged? Is this just not the way they I did judiciary I don't know. I, I didn't, like, call yeah, into the, yeah. the judicial history, but, it, yeah. yeah, I wonder if, I mean, I, I imagine if they'd done them all concurrently, it then would have just been a much longer prison yeah. term, yeah. but, any, but yeah. maybe they didn't do it that way. It just... I know, it, but it's, yeah, it seems brutal, and because yeah. he was... It, he's 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 has threatened to make it very warm for all in any way connected <laughs> with his prosecution should he ever gain his freedom. Now that's a bad pun. Yeah. Make it very it warm. Is bad. Yeah. But he may have used it. <laughs> and then he they eventually they they let him free before charging him the third time when he he paid or somebody paid five hundred dollars wow. bail and he agreed. To go to Massachusetts. You know? Oh, basically get out of right. town. Right, and yeah. sort of ironically, he had learned the shoemaker trade while he was in prison, and he, you know, and he became a shoemaker. Became a shoemaker somewhere in Massachusetts. Huh. That, what was the? Is it just the bullying that stemmed? He just he just had grudges. He just as was, far as we know, and we don't know, we don't know the um, content of it or anything. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that. That where that comes in is in Bertha Miller's and Bertha and Frank Miller's vignettes, and Frank Miller and his brother were among the boys mentioned as people who were were schoolmates of his, so they would have known, I guess. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, real. So it, but you know, it's it's that's kind of the the only whiff of it, but you know, clearly he, it wasn't. Because he burned the school first? He burned the school first. Yeah. Well, we don't know, but, yeah, but, but in retrospect, we have an idea it seemed, that yeah, yeah, he burned the school first. I think that was a little brick school. Uh, well, we visited that. Burned, that was yeah. in number one, right? That was Yeah, right. number one. And, and uh, I guess it was so badly burned that they just... You know, knock the walls down and start. Yeah, I think the walls were le- like there was an end wall left. Yeah. The other interesting thing, I I got a novel out of it years ago. <laughs> there uh, it a is. A novel called Westminster West. It's actually available as an ebook oh, even neat. now. But the the vignette that first attracted my interest was at the Gorham farm. There were two young women, two sisters. One of them, Susan, had taken to her bed several months before and you know had some one of those mysterious victorian illnesses, illnesses. Yeah. <laughs> couldn't get up had the vapors the vapors the yeah. night of the fire she got out of her bed and went and helped and you know did everything like you know like yeah putting and out the fire. that very night her sister 
took to her bed and basically never <laughs> never resumed a these normal life. Yeah, these Victorians yeah. were so. Somewhere. And their brother Ed Gorham, also schoolmate of Johnny Coombs, probably took these photos. He was interested in photography and later became yeah. a moderately famous musician in Boston. So there's, there's a, Westminster West has many, many volumes of, of family photographs, essentially, that probably, you know, yeah. kind of organized around Ed Gorham's interest in doing that. And then the Historical Society recently, um, our trustee, Kathy Lisi, has digitized the photographs. So that's what, how that's we happen to be this, able to yeah. have them. So it's a it's a really interesting archive that we don't have anything like that for the town of Westminster. I can't imagine not any anywhere <coughs> that, not in the East. That, that would be able to talk about something that happened yeah. in the eighteen yeah. eighties and pull up a picture of this guy and his mother. This is yeah. just amazing. Yeah, we, we have all these fire all these photos in the West Parish, but the, the East Parish doesn't have similar right. thing. I guess it's all because of Ed Gorham. Ed Gorham, yeah. and yeah. who knows Gageville? You know, yeah. I, I have no idea. Yeah. And the other well, the other thing that's sort of as we've been, we talk about the cellar hole investigators, but we went out yesterday, and the thing that was surprising to me is the, the locations of the fire are actually relatively within walking distance. Oh, yeah. Because he would have had to he either walk walked, or take yeah. a horse. And right. We were, like, the, the farm we were at yesterday was just down from his house. Yeah, yeah, very conveniently yeah. located. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Harlow, that was actually the farthest afield north of Westminster West Village was a pretty good hike for him I would yeah. think but but we're out of time yeah. we're gonna have to come back we have old Grimes up here and we didn't get to talk about old Grimes because he's a famous That's another right. famous yeah. Westminster personality <laughs> yeah who went over his his offspring went overseas right right and, to, to Hamburg Germany yeah, yeah. incredible story <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Marty. Marty's always amazed that I get so involved in this history just stuff. totally into it. Yes, I am. Totally I'm sorry. Well, um, next week on the feed, it's a surprise. Is it? <laughs> it is. It is we a don't surprise. Know. We're not sure. <laughs> We're not sure who, not what's sure going to happen. Next week on the feed, it might just All be right. us. Well, thank you for coming, and uh, yeah. thank you guys for coming. It was another great show. I hope you're going to come back. I know Chris is going to do yep. um, Native American cooking next month, so that's yep. going to be cool. Uh, yeah. That'll be fun. All right. Bye, community. Bye, community. That's it, folks, for the feed. Be sure to catch us every Wednesdays at 7.30 a.m. Also, find us on Facebook at Fact TV. Or tell us what you think. The feed 8 at gmail.com. And don't forget to watch the feed online at www.factate.com.